Klarna is a payments company headquartered in Sweden. Since being established in 2005, Klarna has grown to handling $21 billion in online sales as of last year. Roughly 40% of all e-commerce sales in Sweden go through Klarna. Klarna's original differentiator was that it allowed users to check out of e-commerce stores without entering in credit card information. Instead, the user enters an email address and registers with Klarna. This allows Klarna to assume the risk of the transaction in place of the credit card company. Klarna's clever payment method became very popular, and 13 years later, Klarna is actually a bank with a variety of financial services and payment methods. Marcus Granstrom is a director of engineering at Klarna. His work ranges from product development to systems architecture to management, and this cross-functionality of the role has some similarity to Raylene Young from Stripe, who is also an engineering director at a payments company and was on the show yesterday. Marcus walked me through the life of a payment hitting Klarna servers, and this was a nice starting point for a conversation about Klarna's infrastructure, their product, and their engineering practices. I enjoyed the show, and I hope you enjoyed it as well. Before I get started, I want to mention that we're hiring a creative operations lead for Software Engineering Daily. If you're interested in that role, check it out at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash jobs. This is a great job for someone who just graduated a coding boot camp or someone who has a background in the arts. If you want to be creative and you want to learn more about engineering, check it out at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash jobs. Azure Container Service simplifies the deployment, management, and operations of Kubernetes. Eliminate the complicated planning and deployment of fully orchestrated, containerized applications with Kubernetes. You can quickly provision clusters to be up and running in no time, while simplifying your monitoring and cluster management through auto-upgrades and a built-in operations console. Avoid being locked into any one vendor or resource. You can continue to work with the tools that you already know, such as Helm, and move applications to any Kubernetes deployment. Integrate with your choice of container registry, including Azure Container Registry. Also, quickly and efficiently scale to maximize your resource utilization without having to take your applications offline. Isolate your application from infrastructure failures and transparently scale the underlying infrastructure to meet growing demands all while increasing the security, reliability, and availability of critical business workloads with Azure. To learn more about Azure Container Service and other Azure services, as well as receive a free ebook by Brendan Burns, go to aka.ms slash sedaily. Brendan Burns is the creator of Kubernetes, and his ebook is about some of the distributed systems design lessons that he has learned building Kubernetes. That ebook is available at aka.ms slash se daily. Marcus Granstrom, you are the director of engineering at Klarna. Welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you, and thanks for having me. I want to start with a high level description of what Klarna is. I think there's probably some people listening who are unfamiliar with it. So the core Klarna product is a payment solution. It's a checkout solution, for example, for shoppers on the internet, and it allows them to do things like pay later or slice up a payment. Can you describe what the core Klarna product does? Sure, absolutely. So if we start from the merchant's point of view, we basically have two sets of products that we offer to our merchants. Either we offer a full-blown checkout where we do credit card, uh, direct debit, pretty much any payment options you can can think of. And then, of course, our own uh, credit products, which is uh, pay later and slice it, which is what we when we offer. So you can pay after, you, after delivery or you can slice up uh, your payment over in, installments or base accounts or different, depends on market a bit. We also then offer what we call the Klarna payments, where we sell individual payment methods, which we usually do for larger enterprises where they have their own credit card integration, for instance, and just want credit options or they just want direct debit. So we can we can either do the full thing or, or small smaller packages of it. So there was this period of time in maybe the last 
two to eight years where there was this revolution of online payment solutions and fintech companies. Klarna was certainly in that wave of companies. Why was there such a revolution in the way that online payments occurred? And why hadn't that problem been solved in the first 10 or 15 years of the internet? No, I think that's when when e-commerce really took off and uh, when people who are perhaps not as tech savvy started using the internet more in my in my mind at least so if we talk about the history of cloud it basically started with uh, providing a way to pay for with invoice in in sweden when you bought online because people were afraid of handing out their credit cards and uh, and stuff like that that's how cloud got started and then it for us then grew from there out, out to new markets out to new payment methods and, and stuff like that and i think people want a different solution than their sort of uh, regular credit card which is not as strong in Europe as it is in, for instance, in the US where credit card has a, has such a large grip of the market. So Klarna is a way for paying without a credit card. Is that what you're saying? That is what I'm saying. So we basically, for instance, if we offer pay later, which is uh, something that's very successful in, for instance, fashion retail, where we buy clothes uh, that you want to really try out before you before you actually commit and pay for them. You can pay with our pay later product. You order your stuff, for instance, on ASOS in the in the UK and US, and then get your stuff shipped home, try it out, uh, fits great, and then you get get a payment instruction from us how to how to settle your your fee to, towards uh, towards Klarna then because we have already paid the merchants uh, sort of guaranteeing their their income and then it's uh, you would have a have a debt towards Klarna. Then. Right, and here we start to see some of the complexities of the payment system from Klarna's point of view. So obviously you simplify it for the user because they don't have to pay immediately, they get their clothes, they can try it on. But from Klarna's point of view, then that seats you with all kinds of interesting problems. Like you've now got a debt on, on your books, the, the consumer owes you money. You know, you have to have some information about the consumer in order to evaluate whether the consumer is credit worthy in order, you know, should you even give the consumer the right to buy these shoes? got to figure out you know how long should we give the consumer to pay us back what's the interest rate that we should charge etc so there's all kinds of technical complexities that stem from that simple user experience and then that gives rise to i would assume lots of engineering problems and challenges absolutely i mean that's uh, that's one of the one of the things that makes it hard i guess to offer credit online because uh, you can't really look at the person in in look at their ID and know who they are. So we we have different ways of uh, of both uh, identifying authenticating users to to be able to extend them credit, and then we of course uh, use uh, different means of, of uh, obtaining data around uh, for the consumer. So we can go to external lookup agencies if needed, or we or we have uh, information about you already because you're already a, a customer. Yeah, this is one of the interesting like privacy trade-off things where, you know, I think a lot of the discussion around privacy these days is like, I don't want to give up my data because I'm going to be a health insurance company is going to raise my rates or I'm going to get advertisements that I I don't want to give my information to some company that's going to advertise strange things to me. I think people often overlook the benefits of giving away data, like you might get a better credit rate or, you know, if you get your health data away more wantonly, then maybe your healthcare provider can find solutions about you more aggressively. So it's, I don't know, it's, it's the credit opportunities for giving away your data. I think that's a contemporary example of where it actually, you can benefit a lot from, from giving away more data. At least the kinds of, I think the kinds of people that are listening to this podcast probably will generally benefit from giving away more data. Yeah, and I mean, but at the same time, it's a super serious and advanced topic where where we we spend sort of the data we have about consumers is, is sort of our number one priority to protect in in all means, and we we don't uh, because that's sort of our our secret with the with the with the consumer. We really do do never share it with with anyone else, and we we try to. We try to sort of phase it out when we when we don't need it anymore and, and stuff like that. So it's a, it's really but like you say, it's it's what makes our business uh, possible. So if we don't have any any information about you, you, we will not be able to to extend your credit basically, because then you would uh, be a blank person. I think I read something is like forty or sixty percent of payments in 
Europe or what's what's the what's that mind blowing stat that like how many payments or what percentage of payments go through Klarna? Yeah, so it's uh, I think it's, uh, what you're referring to is forty percent of the payments in in Sweden, uh, in Sweden, go, sort of, right. on, and then online payments goes to to Klarna. I think without being a hundred percent sure, I think we're around ten percent in in overall in Europe. So we do quite significant volume, sort of. So that's enough of a sample size where you could develop so much information, and you've been going for like eight years or something like that, nine years maybe, where you've got a good enough sample size where just from Klarna data alone. You can probably evaluate who is credit worthy with a lot of accuracy. Like, how how much at this point do you need to go out to sort of third party data solutions versus just kind of using the data you have in house? No, we use we use a lot of data in house. We go out to sometimes to credit agency mostly to verify. So if you if you claim to be someone and you cl- claim this is your phone number, for instance, uh, we can go out to to look up agencies and sort of verify that to be able to to verify that you, you actually are you and not uh, not some fraudster trying to use someone else's persona. But in general, we, we have a lot of data. We, we of course, do a lot of uh, data on uh, where you live and demographics and such stuff as well. But it's not something that we, uh, we sort of advertise or talk about how exactly we do our credit policies. Sure, sure. Yeah, we, I mean, we don't need to go into that. But what I think is interesting is, so you, you get this model that's working really well where people can basically pay with an email address or a phone number or some, some kind of identifying information like that that is more frictionless than a credit card. Exactly. And we want to, I mean, we really want to try to remove all the friction we can. That's basically our goal to create a, a smooth experience for when you do payments. So the less friction, the better is, is where we go. So if it's possible, only re- require the email to, to basically take you on as a customer. That would be the ultimate uh, thing. And we do that in a, in a lot of cases. And especially if you're a returning customer, uh, then it's uh, then we know your usually your browser and, and then it's so much easier. I want to spend a little more time laying out the the business model and then we can get into some engineering problems but so i think we've laid out the fact that there are people who can pay now and then they get basically a debt to klarna the merchant gets paid immediately so here we you know we were already kind of laying out this this fact that you, you have all these debts on the books that you can can kind of figure out how to play with and you've got a bunch of information about users that you have to aggregate so you've got kind of a data engineering problem that we can start to think about so from the business perspective today klarna is actually a bank so you're you're classified as a bank can you talk about the difference between a bank and a fintech company and and maybe just describe the journey from being this fintech company where you had this really well-defined payment solution that was working really well and then you're like oh let's just become a bank what that classification even means i think of a bank as kind of like a, a changing and weird old world uh definition but i'd love to hear your thoughts on that semantic difference Yes. So, I mean, for us uh, so far, it has meant fairly little difference. We, we're currently exploring the opportunities that we have as being a bank, and we're starting to offer some other products. The journey we've been on has been basically that we, we started looking a lot how we can make consumers happier in general. And then a lot of those things come with providing products that we would need a banking license for. It's a slow and long process acquiring a banking license. Uh, so, but so far it's been very beneficial. We're just in the process of launching our our own credit card. Uh, uh, we just uh, launched it to a portion of our uh, consumers in Sweden. So we started to to explore some opportunities there. We'll uh, roll it out across Europe in the coming months. That's like a Visa or a Mastercard or something. That is a Visa card together with Visa. Then who who is one of our owners? They took a one percent stake in Klan about a year year and a half ago. Cool. And this is something I should know by now. But why is it that Visa and Mastercard are so dominant in in terms of the credit card space? Why isn't there more credit card companies, or, or do you just not even need to? invent a credit card is it something like aws where it's like it doesn't make sense for us to stand up our own cloud provider we should just leverage it because it would leverage the existing infrastructure because really we would gain nothing by setting up our own credit card network that visa has already done yeah i think the investment required to do visa and mastercard sort of level uh, penetration on the market is uh, it's just too big for pretty much anyone in these these days just uh, just think about the 
how would you get your credit card into the machines, all those millions and, and millions of, uh, of merchants? And who would trust it? I think that that ship has sailed, basically. Right, yeah. right. Okay, so the banking license, it's, you know, maybe it takes some time to get, but it doesn't really affect your operations or your engineering. It really just affects kind of the products that you can offer. Like, can you offer mortgages, for example? Like, you, you can't do that until you're a bank? No, we, we definitely could. Theoretically, we could offer a mortgage. We can also offer higher amounts. So when it comes towards the consumer, one thing that we've been doing is, is releasing the credit card. One thing we've done towards uh, merchants or businesses is more that we started issuing, uh, issuing credit and loans to them, basically, to help them grow faster. And getting a loan at a conventional bank today for a small, medium business is a pain. The interests are high. The process is really old-fashioned and not sort of suitable to, to online companies. So what we started doing in a, in a small scale so far, which we'll start also pushing out, is, is basically providing loans initially to our merchants, but also eventually to, to other companies where we, can, where we can leverage the knowledge we have about giving credit and risk analysis in a short amount of time to basically apply online and instantly receive your money basically for 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 businesses as well yeah you know i've never really thought seriously about taking on debt for my company but whenever i log into quickbooks or whenever i like log into paypal it's like hey do you want to borrow a hundred thousand dollars at this really low interest rate and i'm like that's actually a really low interest rate i'm really and i'm sometimes very tempted to just like oh man, I'll, I'll just take the 100k why not yeah, no, I think we spotted a, a problem for our merchants. So basically, the biggest problem they have when they're growing is that they don't have enough cash at, at hand to buy more stuff to, to right. sell, basically. Well, uh, certainly so for then, apparel companies, like I can imagine that being a much more significant problem than a podcast company. Yeah, 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 exactly. I don't think they have a, that much in common. So that's where we basically can help them to grow faster. And of course, in return, we will grow with them. So. DigitalOcean is a reliable, easy-to-use cloud provider. I've used DigitalOcean for years, whenever I want to get an application off the ground quickly. And I've always loved the focus on user experience, the great documentation, and the simple user interface. More and more people are finding out about DigitalOcean and realizing that DigitalOcean is perfect for their application workloads. This year, DigitalOcean is making that even easier with new node types. A $15 flexible droplet that can mix and match different configurations of CPU and RAM to get the perfect amount of resources for your application. There are also CPU-optimized droplets, perfect for highly active front-end servers or CI-CD workloads. And running on the cloud can get expensive which is why DigitalOcean makes it easy to choose the right size instance. And the prices on standard instances have gone down too. You can check out all their new deals by going to do.co slash sedaily. And as a bonus to our listeners, you will get $100 in credit to use over 60 days. That's a lot of money to experiment with. You can make $100 go pretty far on DigitalOcean. You can use the credit for hosting or infrastructure, and that includes load balancers, object storage. DigitalOcean Spaces is a great new product that provides object storage. And, of course, computation. Get your free $100 credit at do.co slash sedaily. And thanks to DigitalOcean for being a sponsor. The co-founder of DigitalOcean, Moisey Uretsky, was one of the first people I interviewed, and his interview was really inspirational for me, so I've always thought of DigitalOcean as a pretty inspirational company. So thank you, DigitalOcean. Okay, so when I go to an apparel company and I purchase something through Klarna, What's happening on the back end when I'm making that purchase? What's going on in Klarna's infrastructure? So basically what happens is that we, uh, yeah, let's say it's a checkout solution. So we own the JavaScript that is loaded. The, basically the whole checkout that is loaded on the merchant site though, is owned by Klarna because we, for regulatory reasons, need to 
provide the terms and conditions and we need to prove that you actually had the chance to to view and accept those terms and conditions so we can't put it fully in the merchant's hands so the javascript is loaded to us when it comes to the back end we sort of first identify you who you are as a person and then we decide what payment method to offer you so let's say you we we find you very credit worthy uh, then we will p- offer you all the different uh, credit options pay later slice it if we we find that you perhaps is not the most credit worthy person because you just took that hundred thousand dollar loan and haven't really paid it back then we would probably only offer you to pay with the direct payment methods like bank transfer or credit card or something like that okay so like let's say i click to pay later and so there's then some kind of email gets sent to me and what are the other things that are happening on your back end yeah so if so like pay later then it's uh, then it usually depends on on uh, that it's a pay off to deliver like a 14 day uh, credit so we at that point we just uh, enter that order in in our system and then we don't actually do anything for a while until the merchant actually tells us with through their sort of integration their post purchase integration tells us hey we've we shipped the goods so and then we actually issue the the debt in in our systems and then we it's also when we send the first sort of payment information letter or email where we tell you hey your goods are on its way you should receive them any day and uh, and hear how you settle your uh, settle your in, your invoice or uh, debt to to Klarna. so that payment is waiting in like it's a, a database entry or a queue or something and yeah, then yes in what we in, in what we internally call our our issuing systems basically so we have several different issuing systems de- depending on country and then uh, it sits there and and basically waits for your payment which you the majority of our consumers do to our app in their phone and, and are there any unique database requirements for that like are what are you using like mongo or dynamo db or something so it depends actually all these issuing systems are are, are a bit different but uh, you can say that all our order management actually lies in in, in dynamo so we use uh, aws for a lot a lot of stuff so it li- relies heavily on dynamo db uh, so that's where we restore it when it comes to the actual issuing systems they run on both postgres and also one that uh, works on a oracle database so it, uh, it's a bit different Interesting. So is it the same data that's sitting in, in Dynamo and... Yes and no. So we basically try to decouple the purchase experience. So the issuing systems aren't really affected when a purchase happens. So a purchase comes in through checkout, it goes through the risk decision, and then it ends up in uh, in our order management system. And that's where the purchase flows, the synchronous purchase flows ends. Then we do uh, event-based to inform the issuing systems about the uh, only about the consumer and their potential debt. Then. Because the merchant's uh, information is managed by the order management system towards, uh, out towards the merchant. So there's a, there's a clear decoupling between what the... Usually what you would say, uh, if you talk about a credit card scheme, sort of the acquiring and issuing parts of, uh, of that is, is decoupled in our world as well. Okay, and that event trigger, so, so this is like when the consumer makes the purchase, it gets synchronously written to, to Dynamo, and then it also gets written to some relational database, it sounds like, and then you have an event trigger somewhere that... Yeah, so basically the Dynamo triggers the event and then the issuing system then picks that up if it's for their market and then puts it into the, the relational database. When the merchant then captures and calls our order management system, there's another event triggered saying, hey, this uh, order with order ID was just shipped. They sort of activate the debt then and then and that in, its, in turn then triggers a bunch of different events uh, depending on what payment method they have and, and stuff. If it if it's a pay later, we send them payment instructions. If it's a someone that has a, a base account with us, we just add it to their monthly invoice, uh, and then they get their payment instructions when, whenever during the month they, they set up their payment. So it, it's more or less completely decoupled from the order management and from, from the merchant side. So the acquiring is sort of standalone, and that's why we can have one sort of acquiring system but several different issuing systems because they don't don't they don't really have a dependency between them can you define those terms acquiring system and issuing system sure if you talk about the traditional credit card scheme an acquirer would be one that sort of brings in the transaction sort of and the issuer would be the one that 
issues the credit card pretty much your bank uh, because they will hold the balance for your account it goes the same for us for instance we in 2017 we acquired a company called bill pay which was a, a competitor with two hours in germany and then they of course have sites that run uh, where you pay with uh, bill pay and then we then sometimes use bill pay as an acquirer but then have our have Klarna as the issuer so we can actually have different acquirers and different issuers in our uh, in our systems. I don't know if it makes uh, makes sense the way I try to explain. It. I think it's probably beyond the scope of this particular episode. But uh, talking to some of these fintech companies has made me just realize that I uh, I think I need to go a little bit deeper on some of this like just the banking and credit card infrastructure, and it's, that's more of a characteristic of this entire category of fintech type of companies and it's not really in the scope of something that's like differentiating for Klarna it's like I, I agree and I mean it's a very niche uh, sort of <laughs> do, domain to be and if you if you don't work in it you you really have no no idea or no usually no interest in knowing this stuff as well but it's curious like the banking slash credit card rails they're kind of strange and niche are they changing at all is that infrastructure going to change in the future or do you see any reason why it would change I honestly don't think so. I think it's sort of if we talk about the Visa scheme and the MasterCard scheme there, they of course they do small improvements all the time, but it's it's such a beast. So I think I think it will stay that way. My guess is that the credit card part of payments will reduce over a bit over time. We will have always have but other payment methods will sort of uh, replace and i think we see that a lot in uh, india and china where where you have where you have different uh, payment options sort of in bricks and mortar stores than we do in do in europe and the us yeah well so that, that event triggering going back to the the event triggering you kind of have these different uh, events that can be kicked off throughout your system to to just propagate a payment or the different side effects of a payment you kind of have this different events are going to trigger you know you send an email based off of some circumstance or send a message to the merchants side of things based on some event trigger how do you do event triggering what's the general pattern what are the the are you using lambda or kafka or some you know what, what kinds of stuff are you using Good question. We're on a fairly large uh, Kafka cluster that we that we use for for pretty much all the non-synchronous communication we do. Sort of can be uh, internal event sourcing that uh, that some teams do, or it can be events to notify notify others about uh, what what's happening in the in the ecosystem. So that's a general sort of pattern that we use. We try to we try to avoid the sort of tight coupling with uh, synchronous calls. Uh, so we do mostly mostly events when but not necessarily needed, which is very rarely. Basically, it's only in the synchronous purchase flow which has sort of time requirements on. So is there like event listeners? somewhere that are listening for the kafka topics to be updated or absolutely so there's for instance the place order event which which is uh, the event that i talked about before when when the order management system has sort of accepted the order and everything is done in the in the purchase flow they issue this order place event and i think it's i think it's over 10 different systems that currently listens to that event for for different reasons can be for analysis it can be for the issuing of the debt like we talked about it can be for uh, it, it can be for sort of uh, uh, updating the consumer side of, of their app. So we have a big uh, app in both uh, uh, Google Play and App Store that where you can uh, download that. And that also needs to be sort of has its own sort of view of, of orders. So that listens to orders and stuff like that. So so it's up to the teams what to listen on and what to, what to discover. What have you learned about operating a large Kafka cluster? A good question. This is not something I I am an expert in, but I think we've uh, we fairly quickly realized that you can uh, configure it either for for throughput or for latency. You can't, at least to my knowledge, have both at the same time. So we we're we're very focused on on, on throughput because latency we don't do or we shouldn't do latency throughput uh, like of, reliability. You mean or? yeah, reliability and and sort of volume, the amount of events that we can push through push through the cluster before it gets problematic like order consistency as opposed to like low latency and questionable ordering yeah exactly and the deliver deliver one sort of promise uh, so that's uh, definitely something that takes uh, where where we are but like i said i'm i'm really not into the details there but <laughs> okay. that, uh, that, that is what i what, what i uh, from my limited knowledge knows at least no problem so that that alone is is an interesting tidbit and i'm sure it's useful 
So we've kind of talked about the transactionality of just a payment going through and how you kind of you know write to different databases and how that trigger updates different constituents that are interested across your infrastructure. And, and I'm sure there's a lot more meat to that. But I'd like to talk more generally about the platform engineering for Klarna. So I mean, you got data scientists and data engineers and, and people that are writing different front ends and people that are spinning up experiments. Do you have a, a standardized, and you know, there's obviously releases for all these things too. So do you have like a standardized platform engineering team that defines what cloud providers we use, what languages we use? Do you have any kinds of uh, standardization across the organization? Yes, we do. We have an architect board, which I'm personally a member of, that consists of, I think, we're around 12 people. We meet once a week to discuss everything from those topics, sort of uh, programming languages, to which databases do we want to invest in, uh, what makes a good event, basically, how how do you provide enough data in an event in a good way, and how stuff like that. So we're fairly standardized when it comes to programming languages, when it comes to databases, cloud providers, and stuff like that. We sort of have to be with the with the amount of sort of engineers we have and the, what we want to sort of achieve by doing that, it, it is, of course, a bit limiting to teams that they have to choose between four different programming languages. But the, the flexibility that it gives us both with the possibility for, for engineers to go to new teams, but also for to, to move services to other teams if we, if we change the, the mission of one team that, uh, and then sort of those are sort of overweights the sort of that the teams can do whatever they want. So, uh, we had that approach previously where teams were more free in, in the technology choices and especially the programming language choices. And then we have, we've had so much uh, pain when, when we wanted to move, uh, move stuff around. Uh, so then we we basically restricted to Java, JavaScript, Scala, and Erlang uh, as the as the four languages that we that we were that we sort of invest in, and we have where we also have very. So you said Ruby, Scala, Erlang? No, sorry, Java, Scala, JavaScript, and Erlang. So where we also have in-house sort of expertise on uh, on on all those uh, all those languages. So if you if you for a team run into a corner case somewhere, we uh, there will be someone internally that you can can ask. And the same goes with databases. We're quite uh, committed to to Postgres and Postgres RDS, and we have some really really hardcore Postgres uh, debug. If, if needed internally that's the only reason we've gone more or less with uh, uh, with postgres is that we we have these experts in-house and uh, and that why would anybody go with mysql when we have postgres experts in-house that's uh, that's sort of been the been the reasoning behind that scala and erlang tell me about that so clone is a functional shop from the start so when when Klarna was founded the uh, clone has three founders they're all uh, all non-technical they couldn't build the solutions they wanted uh, on their own, so they they asked for help from their first investor. She had worked uh, uh, at uh, Ericsson for a long time, so oh, she yes. knew, <laughs> so she knew a bunch of Ericsson engineers that now ran a consultancy shop. So they basically came in and built uh, built the embryo of uh, uh, of Klarna in Erlang, and then it naturally grew from there. So for a long while, we we were a Erlang only shop. So I think more or less everyone, I don't know if it's true anymore, but five years ago, everybody that worked with Erlang had had or worked at Klarna at some point in their career in Europe. And then obviously that became a bottleneck when it came to, to recruitment. So then we started sort of looking outside of, outside of the Erlang bubble. Scala had in recent years become a good sort of functional language that we, that we also use. And then we initially went to, to Java, which is just a big... Uh, big workhorse in in a lot of companies. Do you find that when you're hiring people that Erlang and Scala side of your infrastructure is is like something that can get people really excited about working at Klarna or it can make them like really anxious about potentially working there? No, I, I think it's both. Uh, we definitely have people who have come to work for Klarna because of our, uh, our Erlang stack. And uh, I don't think we... And those are the people we hire to to work there. We don't we don't push a junior JavaScript engineer into into the Erlang community straight away. We ease him into it a bit. But it's definitely a a, a sales case for 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 some of the engineers that really like and appreciate functional program. Mm-hmm. 
nobody becomes a developer to solve bugs. We like to develop software because we like to be creative. We like to build new things. But debugging is an unavoidable part of most developers' lives. So you might as well do it as best as you can. You might as well debug as efficiently as you can. And now you can drastically cut the time that it takes you to debug. Rookout Rapid Production Debugging allows developers to track down issues in production without any additional coding. Any redeployment, you don't have to restart your app. Classic debuggers can be difficult to set up. And with a debugger, you often aren't testing the code in a production environment. You're testing it on your own machine or in a staging server. Rookout lets you debug issues as they are occurring in production. Rookout is modern debugging. You can insert Rookout non-breaking breakpoints to immediately collect any piece of data from your live code and pipeline it anywhere. Even if you never thought about it before or you didn't create instrumentation to collect it, you can insert these non-breaking breakpoints on the fly. Go to rookout.com slash sedaily to start a free trial and see how Rookout works. See how much debugging time you can save with this futuristic debugging tool. Rookout integrates with modern tools like Slack, Datadog, Sentry, and New Relic. Try the debugger of the future. Try Rookout at rookout.com slash se daily. That's R O O K O U T dot com slash se daily. Thanks to Rookout for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. My first job out of school. The company had a lot of infrastructure in Erlang, and before I was going to start at the company, I spent a couple weeks trying to learn Erlang, and I was having so much trouble, and I was just like really worried about about going to work there, and just like, oh no, I don't know Erlang, I can't figure it out. But luckily, they of course had plenty of other programming languages that they were <laughs> they were using, but it kind of scared me. Yeah, it's a steep learning curve in, in in the beginning, but I'm no Erlang guy. I came in on the on the Java and Scala side, but it's a steep learning curve. And but we have people internally who who have switched from from both uh, Java and JavaScript to to Erlang, and uh, yeah, they seem to seem to like it. What's your cloud provider stance? So at the moment, we run more or less exclusively on uh, on AWS. We are. Uh, more or less 100% a cloud-based company. We still have some legacy uh, running on-premise, but we're, we're moving everything into the cloud. We're experimenting a bit with uh, running stuff on Google Cloud, sort of in parallel, but at the moment we're, we're fairly heavily invested into AWS. The most common service that I hear people using out of Google Cloud is BigQuery. So it sounds like you have some interesting data engineering problems. So has, has BigQuery been a, a potential... A Google Cloud experiment? I would say no. I would say no. I, absolutely, there, it's a great product, and I think we could definitely leverage it. But I think the way we've been experimenting it is more that we will have a not a backup, but sort of being able to route traffic between different cloud providers. So we we are not completely locked into AWS and not co- not completely locked into Amazon. So Amazon is both a partner and a competitor, and some of our merchant has sometimes sort of expressed a disapproval of us running in AWS because they that it's definitely their biggest competitor. Oh yeah, I heard about that kind of concern like a hardware store doesn't want put their online store on AWS cuz they're afraid that Amazon is going to like look into their information or something like that which I don't know, whatever. That's their decision. That you know, they can it's maybe it's maybe it's not paranoid. No, I, I don't think that is a problem, but it's sort of a, maybe it's wrong to use the phrase feeding the beast, but uh, somewhat paying your competitor, although it's a completely different market. I don't think they will ever do something that would uh, would sort of impact the, the but uh, but just making them bigger and more successful. It's, it's, it's very few merchants that has a, have a sure. problem with it. But, sure, but, sure, but, uh, sure. It, it's been mentioned at least. Well, and it sounds like there's equal concern for the standpoint of, I mean, if AWS is a single point of failure, that's not 
great. You know, you, you'd like to have some kind of failover. If there's some sort of weird bug that propagates through Amazon's infrastructure, you would, it would be great to have a failover to, to Google Cloud, right? Absolutely. And I mean, it's, it's a very... It's a very technical, hard problem to to solve with uh, if we do routing outside outside of both cloud providers. But it's definitely something we would like to achieve, and and something we've been sort of experimenting with. And then it goes for the same uh, same goes about routing traffic between different uh, uh, regions in uh, in AWS. Also, is something that we that we spend spend some efforts in trying. So, as far as platform engineering and deployment of your infrastructure. You got started when uh, I guess the state of the art was you're deploying to EC2 instance, or well, it sounds like you had some on-prem stuff, but then eventually EC2, and then today is it containers or Kubernetes or what are you doing there? We will leverage Kubernetes for our sort of toolings, so like uh, build servers and all that, but we we have decided not to run it in production. Uh, we we feel that it's too too many moving parts. We would probably do it in a heartbeat if we were streaming video or something like that. But uh, but when we're managing transactions and people's uh, money, it's, it matters. If it, perhaps it doesn't matter if you miss twenty seconds of a of a movie, but if you miss twenty seconds of transactions, it's a uh, it's, it's a big issue. So we decided not to go there yet. Uh, we're looking at uh, at sort of the maturity and when it, when we feel that it's uh, easy enough for us to to manage it, uh, then then we might take the step. But at the moment, we we run on on easy too. We still run Docker containers uh, just because it uh, provides so much help in in, in running it locally and uh, building and packaging. What aspect of the Kubernetes solution do you feel would increase the? It sounds like you're you're kind of worried about like increase in Byzantine failures and losing some transaction times and maybe due to like Kubernetes networking or something like that. Like yeah, just exactly. So networking discovery, another thing, especially for us as a regulated entity, is sort of access management that we that you need to put on top of Kubernetes. That it at least when I was part of looking into it didn't sort of come out of the box so how you because in how do you know who removed uh, removed pods and stuff like that how do you get a trail and audit log of that stuff so that uh, that is not something that comes out of the box and needs some lay that you need to add on top i'm sure there's uh, solutions out there for for that already but it doesn't for instance if we would run in ecs elastic container service that uh, that that stuff works out of the box with the IAM permissions in, in, oh, in AWS. In auditability. Yeah, exactly. And I'm sure if we would run on Google Cloud, that would also work out of the box. Uh, but uh, but since we don't, we, 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 we're, we're probably looking at, uh, at another solution at the moment. Mm. Are there any advantages? That, like, if, like when you look at Kubernetes versus the infrastructure you have today, obviously Kubernetes is kind of like the trendy thing to do but are there any material advantages when you look at it you're like oh it would be really cool if we were on kubernetes because of x i mean the really cool part is the resource utilization so we're we're fairly fairly poor on the resource utilization we we have a lot of idle time on our servers so that would be obviously a, a improvement and, and what we eventually would like to get out of an orchestration uh, uh, set up like kubernetes or whatever it is but it's not something that we're losing sleep over either but but i mean uh, if we were not a profitable startup then then kubernetes would probably be a a great option for us to to sort of limit costs and uh, and stuff like that okay so getting to the the data engineering stuff so i've talked to some companies that they put their whole kind of data engineering stack in postgres and in in some way and and there's both pros and cons to doing that, but I, I find it an interesting approach, or where they put it at least as much data engineering volume into Postgres as possible. And it sounds like you've got a pretty good Postgres team. What's the data engineering infrastructure like? What kinds of systems are you using, like Spark or Redshift, or you know, what kind of stuff are you using? This is not either my expertise area, but I, I know a bit. <laughs> That's okay. We try to leverage a lot of the, of the AWS resources and services that they provide, so Redshift, data pipelining, and, and all that. And we also we also run our own Hadoop cluster sort of for uh, for batch processing on the side. But uh, we're moving more and more of what we used to have on-premise to, to AWS, and this is the data stuff is sort of the last, uh, last frontier there. So we're, we're definitely uh, heavy users of, of, of Redshift and the different uh, data processing tools in AWS at the moment. 
So we did the show recently with Uber about their data platform. And Uber has kind of an interesting problem where, in some ways, the data is well formed because, like, when somebody takes a ride, you know, there's okay, you've got a driver, you've got a rider, you've got the time that they spent, you've got the amount that they paid, et cetera. So it's like very schematized. But in other cases, it's less schematized because, you know, your selection of, of options in Thailand is probably different than your selection of options in Sweden. Maybe in Thailand, you have the uh, the option of riding like a motorbike and a motorbike only seats one person and it's cheaper. And so you have you have some schema that is well-defined and you have some schema that is less well-defined. So it's so they're in this interesting data engineering situation where, you know, because in data engineering, you in some situations, you want your, your data in some JSON-like object with less schema that's defined up front. But in other situations, you want it in like a parquet file so you can do rapid aggregations and have it in this well-formed columnar shape. Do you have any interesting decisions around that kind of schema? Because, you know, you're, you're offered in different international zones. So I, I don't know if the, the data schema varies by the international zone or uh, is that is that an interesting problem at all for you not that i'm aware of that data definitely differs between uh, countries and and stuff like that but it's uh, but it's still pretty well defined beforehand so i think we can structure most of our data fairly well i would say like i said uh, like i mentioned before data is the part where i've uh, kept my kept my nose out of. right right okay fair enough so what are you mostly focused on day to day? What are the the kinds of engineering problems? Or is it mostly like hiring problems and setting KPIs for people? Yeah, so I work in and run the domain that's called uh, Merchant Services. So my focus is mainly on everything we do towards our merchants uh, before the purchase and, and after the purchase. Uh, a bit in the purchase flow, but, but mainly the other stuff. So it's around how we onboard merchants in a, in a good way, how we do successful underwriting of merchants, because we do underwriting for a merchant to decide if they, if they would have a payment delay uh, because they, they sell shoes and they have 40% return. Turn, so we don't end up in a where we have a exposure to a, a large exposure to a shoe set merchant, for instance, and stuff like that. We also have technical problems like order management and uh, and those everything that comes with that, and uh, how we do merchant lending and the financial reporting part, which is a sort of a beast on its own. Sometimes, how do you inform the merchants about all their sales without being able to give any details about the consumer to them? Uh, well, I wish I would have asked you this question earlier because I know we're almost out of time and I gave a bunch of interesting <laughs> things that I should have asked you about. <laughs> I opened Pandora's box. You sure did. It's cool because it sounds like you got you do a lo- you spend a lot of time thinking about like product level things as uh, you know perhaps as much as the engineering solutions behind them. And that's something that we when we do another part which I spend a lot of time is is hiring. So that's something we're going through this enormous growth phase at the moment. So I I spend personally a lot of time hiring. And what I really value in in, in engineers is when I see engineers that cares about the product because we the teams as we organize them they they will own basically a product or a part of a product and i want them to be i want them to care about that because they make so many decisions on a day-to-day basis that will impact that product Uh, and then they really need to understand why we're why do we have a three-step onboarding for instance Uh, how does that affect the product and the merchant and in in the end and stuff like that is uh it's what I really, besides the obvious, the technical skills and uh, and stuff, uh, other culture fit is what I look a lot about in, in engineers when I interview them. Cool. Well, maybe if there's some other engineer at Klarna that's interested in coming on the show, or if you want to come back sometime in the future, we can talk about product engineering. Because I think that's the kind of that structure where you have the engineers caring a lot about the product. I think that's a little unique. I mean, most organizations I talk to, they have the, the like the PM layer that sort of takes that off the engineer's hands. And I don't know if you have a PM layer, but... Yeah, yeah absolutely. We, we have PMs uh, and sort of my domain then is run together with my product counterpart, but really see them as, as counterpart. It's a give and take, and I want uh, both the engineer manager to both stand up for the technical sort of debt or whatever technical roadmap, but I also want them to, to be full engaged and fully understand what the 
what the product side of things we're building and uh, and be able to to defend why we why we decided to build this part of our insider product like this and not not having to wait wait i have to wait for my product manager they they should they should be so so engaged and, and involved that they should know that i know a lot of other companies where where engineers are seen more as uh, orders takers and uh, uh, don't have to think about why why we're building our products in one way or the other or the other but uh, since we we really try to create these autonomous teams that are so self-going and uh, that uh, it becomes important uh, that uh, that the engineers know why they're doing stuff yeah, I think that I think that'll get selecting for engineers that the kind of engineers you want, the those cross-functional ones, the the lateral thinkers, etc. Maybe not always. Maybe not the Postgres debuggers. Maybe those the, no, <laughs> those people. No, I mean, there's always room for for people with deep uh, deep technical skills, right? And, uh, of course, and stuff like that. So if we do a generalization sort of over of of the engineers that we hire, totally cool. Well, Marcus, uh, this has been great. I really enjoyed talking to you. Well, thanks. Uh, It was enjoyable from my side as well. Thanks again for having me. If you are building a product for software engineers or you are hiring software engineers, Software Engineering Daily is accepting sponsorships for 2018. Send me an email, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com if you're interested. With 23,000 people listening Monday through Friday and the content being fairly selective for a technical listener, Software Engineering Daily is a great way to reach top engineers. And I know that the listeners of Software Engineering Daily are great engineers because I talk to them all the time. I hear from CTOs, CEOs, directors of engineering who listen to the show regularly. I also hear about many newer, hungry software engineers who are looking to level up quickly and prove themselves And to find out more about sponsoring the show, you can send me an email or tell your marketing director to send me an email, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com. And if you're a listener to the show, thank you so much for supporting it through your audience ship. That is quite enough, but if you're interested in taking your support of the show to the next level, then look at sponsoring the show through your company. So send me an email, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com. Thank you. Wow.